Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the board regarding the relative merits of park and impact. I've been an educator for over 30 years, having taught grades three through university. My professional training includes a uh, doctorate in English. I've also been the head of three charter public schools here in Massachusetts and held leadership positions in several independent schools as well, both here and in the Bay Plan. I've administered both the park and the MCAS testing and also served on the state committee that uh, examined the ELA common core standards and made recommendations to the Board of Education in 2010. I have three points I'd like to make regarding the issue under discussion. One speaks to the curriculum content changes that are envisioned in the switch from MCAS to PART. The second concerns a successful track record of the MCAS testing put in place since the late 90s. And the third has to do with it, what I consider to be the historical duty of our schools to our students and families. The ELA content changes that will be in place with the implementation of PARC are well known, I think. The chief architects of the Common Core ELA standards for PARC have been quite clear in emphasizing the new PARC test will prioritize uh, nonfiction over literary study and so-called cold reading over informed contextualized reading. This represents a serious departure, in my view, from the emphasis on literature and rich context, which formed the basis for the MCAS as they were based on the prior Massachusetts State Standards for English. The reasoning put forward for this departure is that most workplace reading will be nonfiction, and students must be directly prepared for this to be successful in college as well as in life. This is a remarkably utilitarian emphasis that would have students examining text whose primary end is to achieve a practical purpose. These essentially rhetorical uses of language are instrumental in nature. All these purposes of writing are, of course, worthy motives and found throughout society. However, in the education of young people, it has been my experience that rich literary historical study is essential for a number of reasons. First, literature is language at its most elevated and complex form. The shades of meaning, the nuance of vocabulary, metaphor, analogy, imaginative expression all find their place in literary study. The training provided by this kind of study is the best preparation for reading any kind of text, including informational text devoted to more immediately practical uses. This is so because once a person has successfully grappled with literature, that student would have experienced language in all its richness and complexity and naturally be prepared to understand less complex uses of language as well. Since language is integrated, is an integrated structure, experience with the most demanding elements naturally leads to a facility with the less demanding. Second, the study of literature is synonymous with the cultural literacy, uh, in this context at least. The study of literature plays, novels, poetry, has formed a stable core of English studies for many decades in our nation's schools. The reason for this is quite naturally obvious. Literature is the highest expression of the humane ideals of a culture and the richest and deepest expression of the power of a language. With the possible exception of Mandarin Chinese, English has the world's largest vocabulary and is arguably one of the world's most influential languages. And by association, the world's most influential literary expression if one includes the two major literary cultures of England and America. American literary writing has been what one scholar called the hospitable canon, welcoming and incorporating literary expression that has its roots in many other cultures as well. In Massachusetts schools, it is reasonable for parents and families to expect their young people to be given the opportunity to assimilate this literary heritage and gain all the advantages that this implies for their careers, as well as for their civic and personal engagement in life after school. In practice, we know that it is all too often the most disadvantaged who are deprived when ill-advised educational changes are made. Since time at school is limited, to diminish this opportunity is to do a great disservice to many of our most vulnerable students. During the course of MPAS testing, the progress of our state schools has been remarkable. Beginning in 2005, the Commonwealth students have been first in the nation in every subject and at every grade level tested on the NAEP. In 2013, Massachusetts took place in the program, uh, took part in the program for International Student Assessment, the PISA. 
Massachusetts student outperformed their peers with a national average in reading as well as math and science. Historically, our schools have been seen as an indispensable help for families and parents in the intellectual formation of their children, with all of this implies. Good citizenship requires an educated citizenry with a strong command of language. This means having a vocabulary that is rich enough and complex enough to encompass not only practical uses, but above all, to enable each citizen to fully participate in the democratic process, both through speaking and writing. A good example would be what's happening here tonight. In addition, each citizen needs a full knowledge of the cultural antecedents that give rise to the current parents in American life. <laughs> Almost done. Okay, that's just a shot clock, I think. <laughs> Without deep and coherent exposure to literary and literary historical study, a young person is ill-equipped to understand and contribute to the life of his or her society. And this brings me to the, the last uh, item. A prominent feature of the proposed part testing and the underlying common core is the emphasis on the so-called whole reading of text as opposed to a more richly contextualized study of literature. Common Core standards implement the reading of text in isolation. Park tests would continue and deepen this approach. This is explained as a way to level the playing field for those students who may come to school without rich historical or literary knowledge to serve as a background for understanding new works. I would propose the real remedy for the situation is to give all students more exposure, not less, to a coherent literary curriculum which has enough depth to make everyone grow in knowledge. The more poorly prepared students catch up, and the more advanced students keep advancing. And I saw this actually come to fruition in, uh, when I was head of a large charge school near Boston on the Malden Mystic uh, Valley. Rather than resign ourselves to the lowest level of achievement, we would be able to then inspire, aspire to continue growing our Massachusetts students as the best in the country and the world. Uh, a few years ago, I read a book called Vernon Can Read. The author was Vernon Jordan, the counselor of the presidents and the distinguished attorney, former president of the National River League. Jordan described his early years working in the home of a successful Atlanta banker who had hired him to work as his chauffeur. When the young Vernon had free time, he would sneak into the banker's well-stocked library and read his literary and legal volumes. One day he was discovered by his employer and was asked quite abruptly why he, a young black man, would be interested in reading any such books. In fact, the employer was even surprised that his young employer could read and explained to the others, Vernon can read, that's the title of the book. In Massachusetts, we can make sure that future students of whatever background will be able to access the best of our literature and have successful careers by continuing on the successful course that has already brought us thus far and given us so much progress. I think keeping our proven curriculum and assessment system is an indispensable step in doing this. Thanks.